Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Food for Thought, which is a series of conversations with business owners, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and thought leaders in the Jewish community. Before we start, I want to thank our sponsor, the Hebrew Free Loan of San Francisco, for supporting our Northern California Jewish community for over 124 years. And this series is another way to offer resources and support. My name is Roman Polnar. I'm your host. And on behalf of the Hebrew Free Loans Business Circle, I'm excited to have this conversation with a special guest, Steve Zimmerman. Now, Steve has done a lot for our Bay Area Jewish community, as has his family. He's a third-generation supporter of the Hebrew Free Loan, and he is its current president. And on the professional side, Steve runs one of the California's largest re restaurant uh, brokerage firms called Restaurant Realty, specializing in sales, acquisitions, and leasing of restaurants, bars, clubs, and related buildings. And prior to starting Restaurant Realty, Steve spent 20 years in the restaurant space and eventually becoming the CEO of a family business called Zim's Restaurants that some of you might remember. And at the time, it was one of the largest privately owned restaurant chains in the San Francisco Bay Area. So whether you're a present supporter of the Hebrew Free Loan Agency, a business owner, or if you're in the hospitality space, I think you'll appreciate Steve's insights and really enjoy this talk. So without further ado, Steve, welcome to Food for Thought. Thank you for the warm introduction. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Nice to be here. Well, you've done a lot for, like I said, the community, the agency, the business community, and there are a lot of places um, we can go, but I thought it'd be best maybe to start with the present and uh, tell us about kind of what made you choose to stay engaged with Hebrew Free Loan over all the years and... Um, ultimately becoming the president? Okay, very, very good question. Um, over the years, I've been fortunate to be involved in several Jewish organizations. Um, and the one that I, I liked the most was Hebrew Free Loan. I first got involved in one of its committees uh, about 12 years ago, and then I got active in the Business Loan Committee. And the reason I was uh, attracted so much to Hebrew Free Loan was because uh, I could see tangible results of the services that it provides. Uh, giving money to business, you know, to people to start a business, to, to to deal with debt, to continue their education, all the different areas that we give loans to, and and I like being able to see specific results from our activities, and that what really gave me a priority to spend time with the organization and you know expand my uh, leadership you know, roles in the organization. And it's been a wonderful opportunity. And uh, I'm very glad that I've been able to do that. And I hope to continue being involved in the agency for many more years. Well, That's wonderful speak stuff. Uh, speaking of the impact and the direct impact, um, you have a personal history with the agency. It was it goes back three generations, I believe, to your grandfather. Right. Yeah. My, my grandfather immigrated from uh, Poland in the 20s. 1920, actually. My father was three years old then. He was born in Poland. And my grandfather's a painting contractor. And he was lured to, to San Francisco because his younger brother uh, somehow came to San Francisco. He was in the upholstery business. And uh, he uh, received the loan uh, probably sometime in the 20s uh, from Hebrew Free Loan. Uh, my grandfather was a donor. Um, and then my father was actually a loan recipient in 1947 when he opened his first restaurant, Zim's, on Lombard Street. Uh, he got a loan from Heber Free Loan. And then subsequently, he got involved in the organization. He was on the board. And so all that obviously played into my motivation to get involved with the agency in addition to the items that I mentioned, you know, seeing the tangible results that the agency provides. So it's been a really wonderful experience, and I look forward to continuing to support it. Well, I know you've been supporting it for many, many years, and it sounds like you probably have gotten to know the agency from every possible angle over all the years that your family has either received loans and has been helped and eventually gave back in so many ways. Oh, yeah. And it's extremely gratifying that, you know, the agency has grown so much in recent years. I mean, 2018, you know, we had uh, about uh, 18, 16, 18 million dollars in assets. Today we have close to 30 million dollars in assets. So it's wonderful to see the growth and expanding our donor base and expanding our recipient base. It's just such a 
wonderful. It gives, gives me a lot of uh, nachas. Well, and you should take pride in that, given that you've been leading the agency as president. Well, it's a, it's, it's a staff and the team that makes it happen. Yeah. It, it absolutely it's, is a team effort. It takes a village. No, and... no question. And we have fabulous leadership, you know, with our executive director. She's fabulous. And with all the agencies I've worked with over the years, uh, no one comes close to touching Cindy Rogoy. You know, she's fabulous. And as, as, as are the other staff members. Yeah, there's uh, there's something to be said for adding heart to the money business. And I think that has been at the soul and at the heart of the agency since its inception. Yes. And really trying to help people very much uh, so. in the most direct way. Yes. So let's talk about some of the family history. You, you've mentioned that your dad borrowed uh, from the agency to start his, uh, his restaurant business. So tell us about that. Yeah, I don't know the particulars other than it was around, he opened his first restaurant in 1947. He had come back from World War II. Uh, originally, he, he had rented the store next door to the, the space, which became our first Zim's on the corner of Lombard Stein. There was a five-bay building. And he originally, after high school, college was not on his radar. Uh, he just went to work because he had to help support the family you know, throughout his uh, years. And uh, so he decided to open a paint store and he, uh, he because the other downside was he could sell his inventory to his father. He had a short term lease, so he didn't have a lot of liability. And so he got this paint store going and mixed paints. He sold wallpapers, he, you know, all the paint sundries and he mixed paints. And ironically, he got drafted in World War II and he, they gave him a color uh, blind test and they found out he was colorblind. <laughs> uh, and he was mixing paints for years for his clients. So it was subsequently when he came back from the war, his younger brother ran the paint store, my uncle, uh, while he was in the service in World War II. Then my uncle was drafted and my father came back, ran the paint store, but did not mix paints. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then there was a vacant store next to the, the ideal paint company. And uh, it was a thousand square foot unit. And he raised a few thousand dollars. And part of the money, you know, a few hundred dollars, I imagine, came from Heber Free Loan. And that's what, you know, helped and build a business which eventually mounted to some 37 units in our 45 year history. So definitely had a big impact on our whole family, Hebrew Free Loan. Wow, so mention that again. I, I don't know if it was my connection or yours, but how many restaurants did Zim? We had a total of 37 in our history, our 45 year history. Uh, most of them were Zim's. We had uh, of the 37 restaurants, I would say approximately 20 some odd were Zim's. We had a couple of Mexican concepts. We had some all-you-can-eat buffets. We had uh, some drive-ins, 50 drive-ins, you know, with uh, uh, girl, girls on real estate uh, on roller skates coming up and, you know, serving food at the car, the old 50-style diner. And so we had, you know, all assortment of different things. And uh, also my father got involved pretty active in the commercial real estate business as well. His, his, his MO was he would open for a restaurant and then the next year he would get involved in some real estate project. So encouraged me to do the same thing. That's largely a result of, you know, what I do today. I tied my real estate background with my restaurant background and decided restaurant real estate was a nice match of my prior experience, you know, working in the restaurants for many years and then getting involved in real estate as well. So it's worked out really well. So before you got into the real estate space that you're in now, mm -hmm. you spent a number of years in the restaurant business. And I, as I understand you at some point, ran Zim's restaurant. Yes. Yeah. What happened was, uh, fortunately, my parents had still a lot of responsibility with me at a young age. You know, every day I had to sweep, do piano lessons, go to dance school, go to Hebrew school. You know, my parents encouraged me to become an Eagle Scout. You know, so I, I had a lot of activity going on in my early childhood years. And then when I was 13, uh, I wanted to go to a jamboree, uh, which is a uh, uh, like a world uh, wide uh, camping trip for, for when you're in the Boy Scouts cost a couple hundred dollars. I approached my father. I said, dad, you know, would you be willing to pay for the, me to go on this trip? He said, well, you know, I think son would be a good idea if you, you know, you, you uh, raise the money yourself. I said, well, I, I don't have $200. He says, well, your, your cousin, David has a gas station. Maybe he could use some help on the weekends. So I started working in this gas station on Saturdays, sometimes Sundays uh, and during summers for about a year or two years, uh, cleaning lube rooms and pumping gas. 
And, and he had worked out a deal with, with uh, David, unbeknownst to me, to, which I learned many years later, that he was paying David to pay me because <laughs> he wanted me to get my, he wanted me to get my, get my fingernails, um, he wanted me to get my fingernails dirty. So I would appreciate when I was 15, being able to wash dishes in the restaurant, you know, where I'd be dealing, instead of dealing with axle grease, I'd be dealing with kitchen grease. And so, you know, peeling on, yeah. So peeling onions and washing dishes and having a roof over my head and being able to eat, it was a, it was a wonderful upgrade versus working in the gas station. It was great psychology. And so I started, you know, working part-time on Saturdays uh, and uh, through high school and I cooked so I learned some of the basics of the restaurant operations and then was fortunate, got a couple of college degrees, was in the service for a couple of years. And I was actually in food service in the service. I was, I was a cook and a mess sergeant and ran a, a dining hall in Hamilton Air Force Base in Marin County, which has now been defunct, but it's a housing project now. And um, I guess I got great institutional food service experience in the, in the service and all the experience I had over the years, you know, going through high school, um, working in the restaurants. And then when I got out of college, second degree, I started working as a manager trainee, um, did that for, uh, and then I started being, they came an assistant manager, general manager. I opened about five or six new units, became an area supervisor, then vice president, president, and CEO. And, um, on, and so it was a, it was a nice journey, uh, one of the strategic mistakes, unfortunately, my father had made over the years was when he opened his first restaurant, since he knew nothing about the restaurant business, he joined the union. Hmm. Uh, we were, uh, and I mean, he didn't personally join the union, but we became a union shop. So because he had a good pool of qualified people that knew how to cook, knew the front of the house, and it was easy for him to make the transition and open, open the business. He knew nothing because his old adage was, if I ever knew how to cook, I would have only had one restaurant, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is true. He never knew how to cook. Yeah, true. <laughs> and yet, yeah, yeah. So it was interesting. And but over the years, um, fewer and fewer restaurants were in the union, and we ended up being the only chain in the union. And we and it was hard for us to compete. The the mm-hmm. single unit operators, and there are only about three hundred to four thousand restaurants in the union. There are now six union restaurants in San Francisco. Um, and we, we couldn't be competitive. It was an, an even playing field. So consequently, the economics didn't make sense. We had a strike and ultimately we went out of business, which is sad, but I learned a lot that has served me well for doing what I do now. So, you know, it, there was positives and there are negatives, but I tried to make the best out of the negatives and put it in the positive side. Yeah. It certainly is a bittersweet experience. I imagine yeah. for yeah. everybody involved, especially for your dad to see there's so much work and effort being put into starting a business. Yeah. To yeah he not see it he was not happy when the business went under, but uh, you know, that's, we, we couldn't be, we, we couldn't be competitive any longer. And so, you know, if the numbers don't make sense, then you move on. But again, I learned, took a lot from that experience and apply it to what I do now. Cause I deal with a lot of businesses that are faltering and are not making money. And so we do a lot of asset sales and I have real empathy being in the shoes of the owners that I'm dealing with, having been there and done it. And so from that point of view, it's been, you know, been helpful having that perspective, being in that, that role. Yeah. I mean, firsthand experience, it sounds like you've gone and seen the ups and the downs and everything in between and running a restaurant. Yeah. It's a very, it's a real challenge. So tell us about then what you currently do at the restaurant realty. So I know that you've sure. spent and you've, I think sold and leased well over a thousand restaurants right. and yeah. tell us about that what are some yeah, of the sure. best lessons learned some of the highlights so, so after uh, actually before zims went out of business um about a year before that i, I knew what was happening because I, I knew the numbers we actually i put the company in chapter 11 got a plan a reorganization plan approved and then started selling restaurants um, gave some restaurants back to landlords ultimately ended up with uh, three restaurants but i knew that i couldn't meet the terms of the plan which is paying back all the you know, liabilities that we had uh, generated as a result of the strike. So I had to ramp up in an area that I thought would make sense. So I took my real estate experience and because I started getting involved in real estate right after, after uh, college. Uh, So I took that experience, took my restaurant operations experience. I thought, "Mm, why don't I sell restaurants? So I worked for a company, a business brokerage company for one year in 1995, still running three restaurants. I had someone you know that I oversaw that ran those three restaurants but I knew it was just a holding pattern and so I got I ramped up in in business brokerage from this new company that I worked for 
uh, did, I don't know, four deals that year. I was the rookie of the year. You know, I think I made a grand total of $40,000. You know, I was, uh, it was not real exciting, but nonetheless, I had to pay my dues to understand the business from the, from the, the get-go. Uh, and then I ended up closing the last three restaurants in October of that year. And I left the company I started with, uh, started my own company, Restaurant Realty Company, in January 1996. So we've been in business for 26 plus years. I was a sole practitioner for about the first uh, eight years. Then I added my first assistant. Then I added other assistants and then eventually added agents to do sales about, uh, I'd say, uh, 12 years after I started the business. And mm -hmm. so consequently, we're, we're statewide. Um, I personally have done over a thousand transactions, uh, leased over two million square feet of commercial space, uh, done over three thousand valuations, and we're growing the business and still very active in the business. And I love it. I enjoy what I do. And right. you still cook? That's the big question, huh? I only cook at home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the sous chef at home. My wife, my wife is a real ball of buster. You know, she does all the cafelta fish and everything from scratch. And so I just do the chopping and the dicing. Say, right. yes, dear, <laughs> tell me what's, what is next, you know? Right. And you yeah, don't mix paint. She, no, no. <laughs> she, and sometimes I barbecue. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's helpful yeah, actually having that experience. I've become a great dicer and chopper. You know? I it's, bet. <laughs> it's a nice- well, I'm sure you've nice learned other lessons. I'm sure you've learned other lessons along the way. And so given that so many of our listeners are business owners and a lot of our borrowers are in the restaurant space, like, what, what pearls of wisdom would you share with them? Just having had that experience of, you know, taking over a family business that was already thriving and established to having to, you know, restructure and eventually close to start new businesses. What are some of the like, top lessons learned that you would offer to a business owner today? Yeah, um, it, it, it's difficult to have different family members working, I think, in the same business. I mean, occasionally it will work, but the odds are that it's probably not gonna work. The personalities don't mesh. The work ethics don't mesh. I mean, one of the major reasons we sell businesses, there are partnership disputes. You know, you have two partners, they, they, they basically, Put, made a 50-50 investment. One partner is doing 80-90% of the work. The other partner is doing maybe 10 to 20% of the work. And there's a clash and eventually a, dis a dispute and a, and, a, and a liquidation or a sale. So, it, you know, when I had a, a good thing with my father, because, you know, he was very active in, you know, his other activities. He was very active in the Jewish community. He was president of several Jewish organizations. He was involved in real estate. So he wasn't really involved in the business and the day-to-day -day business. So it worked really fine. There was no problem, but I've seen a lot of situations where family members definitely clash. Their work ethics are different. Uh, you know, for the example I just gave you, they, um, and inevitably, unfortunately, um, you know, some of the family members leave, you know, and maybe there's only one family member remaining. So it's hard to get everyone to be on the same page. And so it, it generally doesn't work. Um, and so, uh, and, and the attitude of, of younger people today, a good example, I met with a, a father-son situation yesterday, long established restaurant, 40 years, the father unfortunately is very ill and, this, and he's got two sons and one son came in and he's very disenchanted running the business. Although he's doing a good job, he doesn't like it. And he's ultimately gonna phase out and not as a result of any conflict with his father, but just because he's dissatisfied with the kind of you know, demands the business has. It's very hard to get employees and employees that care and so to maintain standards of good service and quality food etc it's he, he he doesn't have the workforce in a, it's an affluent area this restaurant is in to to, to produce the you know the, the quality of product and service that is required and it's very very frustrated and wants to get out and i know for sure my sons i have two sons and they had no interest they saw the hours i put in the business and the problems and challenges of the business and running restaurants was not on their radar at all. You know, they're both in high tech, one's in real estate, one's in high tech. And so it, it's, there, there are a tremendous amount of challenges. You got to really be uh, committed and to, to spend long hours and you, your family sacrifices, you got to work when everybody's playing, you know, you're working on weekends, you're working on holidays and evenings. It doesn't lend itself really well to, uh, you know, family life. In fact, I, 
frequently get criticized now because I've gone the opposite extreme. I didn't spend the kind of quality time I would have wanted to with my kids when they were growing up. And now tomorrow afternoon, every Wednesday afternoon, I go out and I play baseball with my, I, I, I pitch to my grandson, you know, who mm-hmm. plays little league baseball. Uh, he hits and I pitch and then he pitches to me and I go to all his baseball games and take my gr- my granddaughters to the playground and play ping pong and badminton. I spend a lot. I try to spend as much quality time as I can because I have more flexibility now versus and I get criticized occasionally for my kids, which is dad. Why do you spend that kind of time with me? <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, I was making a living. I was running restaurants. <laughs> now I just sell them. So I have a little bit more flexibility in my time. So that's really very nice. I, I love this phase of my life. Yeah, no, it's very great much that you're so. getting that family time. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I am striving to make that a big priority without a doubt. Um, are, so it sounds like it was just as challenging running a restaurant business then as it is today and maybe for different reasons, but what are you seeing right now? And in, in just especially, I imagine, due to COVID and sort of the disruptions? Yeah, uh, 21... Uh, most restaurants have rebounded fairly well. I'd say generally, you know, maybe 70, 80 percent of business they recouped in 2021 and 2022 for a lot of places. Um, their, their sales are at you know, pre-COVID levels or are higher, but there's a lot of added challenges. I, you know, getting getting employees is very difficult, especially in affluent areas where those the employees that work in restaurants can't afford to live in the immediate area. So they have to drive you know, an hour or more. And that adds added frustration and it, it thins out the buyer pool uh, even more. Uh, so it's hard to get, you know, especially in San Francisco or anywhere in the Bay Area, housing prices are so expensive. I mean, it's not, I'm working on selling this restaurant in Livermore. Most of the employees live in Tracy and Modesto and they, they're driving an hour and a half in commute traffic to get there. Well, that's one of the motivations for the my client to sell the place because he can't staff the place. Mm-hmm. So that is a big, big problem. And then obviously there's a certain percent of the of the market that's concerned about, you know, eating in close confines. So people there's less spacing and in, in, interior space. You know, a lot of people have created parklets and outdoor seating areas and have pivoted to take out delivery business, et cetera. So the challenges are are very heavy. But on the other hand, people want, you know, they they've been they've been uh, you know locked in their homes for a year and a half or more and they're tired of inferior takeout delivery and their own, you know, mediocre food. And they want to go out and have entertainment and different kinds of food and, you know, better food and good food. So the, 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 the motivation of the market is there. Just they're a little reluctant, especially the senior people are a little reluctant to just go full bore, but it, it's going to come back. People have to eat. I, I haven't heard of a chip yet that replaces uh, food <laughs> in, in people's, people's uh, anatomy. So I think, you know, people are going to still, be thriving to go out and eat and we're seeing it come back but again it's very frustrating for these owners that are working extraordinary hours to try to fill the shifts uh, Mm -hmm. you know to to serve the people because they can't get the employees that they need to staff frustrating so customers have to be more tolerant it's going to take more time to get served and uh but you know it's certainly a nice alternative to getting secondary uh inferior home delivery you know that's mushy and not hot, et cetera. Well, there's a social experience of it all too, right? I mean, that's one thing that I think we're all realizing and feeling really, you know, removed from our friends and our communities. And it's just so nice to be able to visit with people or meet new people. Oh, you know, face absolutely. To face. absolutely. There's an experience to it all that it's uh, definitely been on pause. And I'm certainly seeing a resurgence of all of that. So hopefully, you know, the restaurant business and the hospitality businesses in general can uh, can withstand. And I think we as consumers, it's a good reminder to just give a little extra grace to all those businesses that are trying their best to stay afloat. And, and Absolutely. Thrive. Yeah, you have to. Uh, this customer has to be patient these days, but uh, just allocate more time, you know, instead of getting out of a place in 30, 40 minutes, add another 15, 20 minutes, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, But you're going to get better food than what you probably used to consuming at home and, uh, and a nice environment that uh you know maybe has some entertainment features to it you know meeting right. with friends etc so so steve do you only work now with restaurants or you have other types of businesses that you help by their sell sure we uh, specialize in restaurants bars uh, clubs um i say clubs i'm talking mainly like nightclubs um 
other related um, food service businesses, which include convenience stores, uh, catering companies, commercial kitchens, food trucks, implant feeders, the whole myriad of food service, wine stores, um, and then related commercial buildings, which means in order for us to sell a commercial building, it has to have a restaurant, bar, club, or, or food service facility of some kind attached to it. And usually the owner of the building owns the, the restaurant, bar, club. So we're selling the, the restaurant business with, a, with, with the real estate. In some cases, the real estate may be multifaceted. Like we recently did a deal in Oakland. It had six restaurants on the ground floor, two floors of apartments with adjacent buildable land. Mm -hmm. And and it was actually a deal with another piece of property, which was a retail center anchored by a restaurant. So we do multifaceted commercial projects, but again, always anchored to be true to our specialty and our niche of, um, you know, restaurant related businesses. And uh, so it's and all my uh, agents and brokers have similar backgrounds to me. They've either managed uh, food service business or own them. Mm -hmm. So again, they have empathy for dealing with the clients that we deal with. They've been in their shoes. And so they can relate realistically to the trials and tribulations of putting together the transaction. Oh, well, you probably have insights. And they've been buyers as well. So they, they understand, excuse me? Well, I said they also have the insights. Yeah, they understand the, the buyer side as well. Exactly. Uh, yes. Yeah. So given that you've had such, you know, long history with the services or food service uh, businesses and hospitality and, and restaurants and clubs and wine bars, et cetera, if somebody is looking to go into the food industry, are, are there any bright spots that you would direct them towards and maybe some areas of opportunity they should be looking out for? Um, well, I think that anyone coming into the business has to be have a realistic perspective of what the um, challenges are, uh, i.e., you know, the hours that they have to put into the business, um, uh, dealing with, you know, customers, with employees, with landlords, increasing rents, you know, margins being hacked away, and you just can't offset increased prices to offset increased costs. You, you alienate your market. You have to have price value. So, Someone that's got, I think that I would recommend, my recommendations for anyone thinking about going into the business, number one, they have experience working in the business, working ideally the back of the house, understand how the kitchen functions, the front of the house, understand how you know, the floor plan works, seating people, waiting on people, working the bar, uh, and then having some management responsibility as well. So I think ideally someone that's had all exposure to all the practical aspects of operations has some financial knowledge, understands how to read financial statements, has a little bit of marketing shtick to them. And uh, they need a combination of all these, these expertise in order, I think, to have a chance to be successful because the, the statistics for independent non-franchised restaurants is that only 20% of them are around after five years. So in three years, there's a 50% failure rate. In five years, there's an 80% failure rate. So, but nonetheless, you, you know, people still are in that 20% area. And some strive and thrive and are around for many years. And so it's a definitely a viable business. People have to eat. And mm -hmm. they're always looking for a new experience. So good and food. for someone who's maybe had a successful or at least a semi-successful business that is now looking to retire, I mean, is oh, there still those. a good market or should they just close up shop? and? Oh, no, no. Or? There's a very good market. Very good point. I just got a call from a gentleman today. I've done four transactions with him in the past. He's in his mid-60s. Mm -hmm. His kids don't want to get involved in the business and it's a thriving business in, in the East Bay. And so he's talking to me about doing a valuation, a broker opinion of value. And, uh, and then I'll get a pre-qualified by SBA, the Small Business Administration loan that will finance up to about 80% on a business or 90% with real estate. And um, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, market it. I said, you know, one of the things I said as I do to anybody in that position is make sure you talk to your accountant or your financial people and find out what the net proceeds are going to be, you know, mm -hmm. what the tax ramifications are going to be because the gross is not the net, as you know, being in the financial business, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, a couple million dollars, uh, fortunately he's got other investments. So he's not depending strictly on the proceeds from the restaurant to retire, but nonetheless, he wants to minimize his tax liability. So I said, you know, analyze, you know, how much is capital gains? How much is ordinary income? What's the depreciation recapture you know, factor going to be, et cetera. And, uh, to find out what your net proceeds are. And he says, 
he's already done that. So, but I always emphasize that, especially to retire people with contemplating retirement, because the net's not the, the gross is not the net for by any means. Um, and you, you can't do a 1031 exchange in a business, you know, unlike in real estate, you know, so um, yeah, you, you got to definitely do some serious financial planning uh, if you're planning to retire from the proceeds of your sale of your business. Yeah. Yeah. Gross is definitely not the net, but it sounds like it's still better than nothing. So yes. Very much so. Try to sell your business. So. Good. And again, well, a, lot, a lot of seniors, you know, it, it's difficult for them to, even if they're in good shape physically, emotionally, it's difficult to cope with, well, what's going to be the next, you know, problem. You know, we had reset, great recession. We had COVID. You know, now we're talking about going into another recession. And psycholo- when you get older, psychologically and physically, you, you can't, people can't deal with them, that kind of stuff. They don't want to deal with it. They'd rather just, you know. If a lot of headwinds. Keep, a lot of headwinds. And, and life is short. You know, this, this guy had a three-way bypass, you know, five years ago. Fortunately, he's recovered. You hang but, out with the grandkids. Uh, yeah, no question. Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, if let's, uh, as we get ready to wrap up, let's uh, take off the business hat and put on your leader of Heber Free Loan hat. And uh, perhaps, uh, you know, leave us with some pearls of wisdom. What what would you see for the agency going forward as you look ahead? Uh, what are some of the things that you wish, you know, our listeners, our viewers um, can help the agency with? And how can we support the agency better? Sure. Uh, well, I see lots of growth opportunities within the agency, expanding our, uh, our base of uh, uh, lending. Uh, we're we're going to be implementing an outreach person to expand our base of uh, borrowers. Uh, we we want to do some unique, um, you know, new programs. In fact, you're heading up one of those uh, committees. Mm-hmm. Um, we're and we're looking at uh, trying to build the organization to expand the services that we provide, the types of loans that we provide, uh, expand our donor base, expand our. Uh, our um, lending base. And uh, basically we're very positive and we have a, a, a group of, which is somewhat unique. Uh, Roman, who is good indicative of that, he's younger than the old days. The Hebrew free board was a bunch of old men. And now we have vibrant young people in their thirties and forties that are very creative uh, and have a lot of uh, perspective in terms of uh, the new generation's, you know, goals and aspirations, and it's very positive. And so we're, we love the fact that we have this new group of young people that are intelligent and devoted and committed and are going to be vital in, in developing and expanding the agent. So we're very, very excited about that. And uh, we're very thankful that you, Roman, as well, part of the organization, as well as your wife, uh, I think it's our only husband wife team that are board members, <laughs> uh, which is wonderful. Uh, maybe you'll be co-president someday. <laughs> that, would, that would be interesting. You're certainly both very qualified to do that. That would be a new new one. Yeah. So uh, who's going to stay home and chop the food? Uh, yeah, you'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure it you out. You guys are very creative. Um, so where 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 does some of the where do you see the agency maybe in five years from now, as you look ahead? Well, as we see the kind of exponential growth that we've had, I mean, it's not not inconceivable we could be a forty to fifty million dollar agency. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, because the need is there and we have the talent and leadership of the, of the, of the agency to achieve that. So I, I'm very bullish on the growth. And even though I'm coming off as president, my two-year term ends and uh, next month, I'm going to be as active as I can in the organization to help be part of this exciting growth uh, opportunity. So very exciting. And I think for um, all of our viewers who perhaps uh, have donated uh, you know, financially in the past or maybe have given some of their time uh, in the past, or maybe they're thinking about it, you know, I, I, perhaps you can speak to different ways that individuals can support the agency and that mission and the vision of being able to support our community as, you know, as our, the world continues to change and evolve, the needs of the community change and for the agency to remain, you know, a bright shining light in our community and helping people in need. Yeah. Well, what is so encouraging is we're seeing people that have been uh, uh, loan recipients, Mm-hmm. Uh, get very active, uh, become donors, and then become leaders in the organization. And it's just wonderful to see. We call this the, the full circle club. They become recipients, uh, donors, and involved in leadership. And th- they really have empathy and understand all the workings of 
you know, the organization having coming, you know, from all sides of the organization. So they, they you know, so, and um, so it, it's very encouraging, you know, for, for people like that to have real empathy and gives, gives them a real perspective in terms of what are the opportunities of the organization having been recipients themselves of, you know, and, and have, which have led to ultimately their success in their, in their, in their personal life and their, their business. So very exciting. As a, as one of those so-called full circle people right. um, who has myself, who I borrowed and helped or Hebrew for loan helped me pay for college and get a degree. And uh, we later came back. So as both donors and then volunteers, I just want to personally on behalf of every borrower, on behalf of the donors, on behalf of the board members, the staff, and the agency, and our community as a whole, say thank you for sure. your leadership and for your service. And I know that every time I ask you this question, or any time I hear other people ask you this question, to sort of talk about you know, what has continued your drive and your motivations to remain so engaged and, and be at the helm, you always say, I wish I could do more. Yes, absolutely. And, and so I just want, on behalf of all of us and the agency and the community, to say thank you for all pleasure. the work that you have done, all the work that you continue to do, and I know all the work that you will continue to do, and um, really helping to shape the agency um, and be in a good position to continue to supporting our Jewish community as sure. our community continues to change and evolve as well. Sure. Well, it's been a real honor to be part of the organization and to work with high-caliber people like yourself. Uh, so thank you for uh, letting me participate today. Thank you, Steve. And to all of you listening, thank you for being here. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Food for Thought. Thank you for your support of the agency, and we we'll look forward to speaking to you again soon.